right, good morning, and welcome to AARP New York's Capital Region Virtual State Legislative Forum. I'm John Lentz, the Editor-in-Chief of City and State Magazine, which is partnering with AARP New York on a series of forums this summer. Issues facing seniors are always important in Albany, but the coronavirus pandemic has made them more important than ever. Today, we'll be talking about a variety of issues on this topic, but first, we'll hear directly from a couple folks at AARP. Now I'd like to introduce David McNally, Director of Government Affairs and Advocacy for AARP New York. David, over to you. Thanks, John. And I want to say good morning and welcome to the City and State Capital Region AARP New York Legislative Forum that we, uh, we're sponsoring. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, first time we've done this upstate, so we're looking forward to a great discussion. I am David McNally, Director of Government Affairs and Advocacy for AARP New York and of course, a homeowner here in the Capital District myself. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us virtually in this very new world in which we live. In a few minutes, John is going to introduce our special guests. These are your state assembly members and senators who represent you, your neighbors, all of us here in the Capital District. John will introduce each legislator and then we're gonna get right into the questions. So we carve out as much time as possible to hear their positions, their plans, and their priorities on issues important to the 50 plus and their families. I wanna emphasize that ARP is strictly nonpartisan. We do not endorse candidates. We do not give money to political parties. We are strictly nonpartisan. The purpose of today's forum is solely to educate our members and our participants on issues important to the 50 plus, particularly here in the Capital District, but across the state. And with that said, I wanna turn it over to Kat Fisher, the Associate State Director, for the greater capital district region. Kat? Thank you, David, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. In the not too distant past, if we were meeting in person, I'd ask for a show of hands to see how many of you have had a loved one in a nursing home or have cared for a loved one at home. And also, how many of you take prescription drugs regularly? I would imagine a lot, a lot of hands would be up. Nursing home, uh, nursing home conditions, uh, family caregiving and prescription drug costs are leading issues for AARP. And today we'll hear from our state legislators about what they're doing or plan to do about those issues. So I'd like to turn it back over to John to introduce your state legislators and get right into the questions. John? Great, thank you, Kat. Thank you, David. Um, just let me point out again that AARP is strictly nonpartisan, uh, same at city and state. Uh, so we'll do our best to avoid political attacks and, and stick to the policy points. Uh, I'll now introduce the six state lawmakers that make up our panel, all representing the capital region. We have State Senator Neil Breslin, Assemblymember John T. McDonald III, Assemblymember Jake Ashby, Assemblymember Chris Tagg, Assemblymember Kerry Warner, and Assemblymember Mary Beth Walsh. Uh, just to note that uh, Assemblymember Walsh uh, will have to leave about 15 minutes early uh, thank you for joining us, uh, state lawmakers. Uh, let's jump right in. Uh, first question, what proposals will you advance or support to address the high costs of prescri prescription drugs, particularly now as the pandemic has made access to affordable prescription drugs more critical than ever? Uh, let's start in the Senate. Uh, state Senator Breslin, uh, over to you. Uh, th thank you, John, and thank you for inviting me to be here to join so many distinguished assembly people to discuss these issues. Uh, prescription drugs, there's a, a lot of different avenues. Uh, one, there's, a, as you know, a current bill in the Senate by Senator Biagi to uh, kind of disallow major drug companies uh, from preventing generic drugs to enter the marketplace. Uh, that's, on, uh, that's now in the Consumer Affairs Committee. I think it probably should be over in the Insurance Committee, but that's for a different day. Also, there's uh, a pharmacy benefit bill, which I think would uh, do much to decrease the costs of ph uh, pharmaceuticals to the, uh, the user. And a, a bill that I sponsored was vetoed by the governor last year. Uh, and uh, there's another bill, a formulary bill, which uh, uh, John McDonald can talk about for, uh, for beyond minutes. And a formulary bill just said that uh, a lot of people join plans to uh, because they use a particular drug. And unfortunately, the day after they join a particular plan, that, that drug that they're 
uh, they join for can be taken out of it. So those two bills will, uh, those three bills will do much to kind of regulate and uh, restrain uh, and hopefully lower the price of pharmaceuticals to the individuals. Also too, with pharmaceuticals, we have to look for new programs that uh, uh, take advantage of volume buying, look for consortiums between and among states, look for better uh, within the state that are buying practices among different municipalities, among the state itself uh, to leverage against the major pharmaceutical companies. And then just to follow up quickly, Senator, um, obviously the second of the three bills you sponsored or was vetoed, uh, the first one, the Biagi bill, and the third one, that formulary bill, you're supportive of those as well? Uh, I, the, uh, the Biagi bill, I haven't read sufficiently to go on record. It appears to be something I would support. The formulary bill was actually a bill that I sponsored, which would have been enhanced. That was also vetoed by the governor. Got it. Uh, and let's go over to the assembly then. And uh, we mentioned Assemblymember McDonald uh, is a pharmacist, often quoted on these issues. Uh, let's start with you, and then we'll go through the rest of the assembly members by alphabetical order. But Assemblyman McDonald, um, what, what are your thoughts? Well, well, a couple of things. First of all, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, prescription drugs are going to become more affordable for many residents of the state because our Medicaid rolls are growing dramatically. Unfortunately, people have lost health insurance. The Medicaid program um, is very low in regards to co-payments and, 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 and also has decent access for prescription drugs. Not perfect, but decent. So sadly enough, um, because of the COVID-19, many people are gonna have at least the opportunity for healthcare and hopefully they will avail themselves of that. But all of us have been really encouraging people to make sure they join the Medicaid program during these most difficult times. You know, I, I do want to mention, uh, Senator Breslin had mentioned uh, two bills that I think um, are critical. The, the PBM bill, the Prescription Benefit Manager bill, most people don't know what a PBM bill is, don't, doesn't know what a PBM is, excuse me. But the reality is they are the entities that manage the prescription drug benefit for the insurance companies, and they negotiate the discounts from the drug manufacturers and the insurance companies. And Interesting enough, when you look at the whole pharmaceutical industry, manufacturers are regulated and licensed, the wholesalers are, the pharmacies are, the pharmacists are, the doctors are, everyone, the insurance companies are actually licensed and managed. One entity is not, the prescription benefit manager. And they manage billions and billions and billions of drugs um, just in New York State alone. And we need to bring them um, under the same type of uh, treatment that the rest of us are under. Because um, I think what we'll find out, what we've found out in many other states, is that uh, for far too long, the PBMs have been able to do um, whatever they want, to be honest with you. And you know, let's be clear, they serve a purpose. And they serve an important purpose. But at the end of the day, today versus 20, 30 years ago, you're using public money. Public money is whole in on the prescription drug benefit. And therefore, we need to be very careful of how we spend public money, and we need greater scrutiny and transparency. So that is very important. Um, I totally agree with Senator Breslin on his bill in regards to the formulary management. I think that it, it got vetoed. Um, I think there's a way to improve upon that. But the bottom line is we're most patients, and I think particularly our seniors get upset. They go to the pharmacy, and the pharmacist says, hopefully in a nice way, but sometimes gruffly, Hey, it's not covered. What do you want to do? The reality is um, we don't want surprises to patients when they join a plan. They, they join a plan knowing what's going to be covered. There needs to be a better process to deal with that. And assembly member, <laughs> um, on the formulary bill and the PBM bill, do you happen to know the, the bill numbers for those? We had a question from the audience about that. I will get them while we go on to, the, go on to my right. friend Jake. How's that? Sure, great. <laughs> well, and, and we could get them. Yeah, other, Senator, do you know? I, I don't know off the top of my head numbers sure, of bills, fine. but uh, yeah. I'd be glad to say anytime you want to call the office at 455-2225, you will easily get the numbers. That's well, area code 518. Yes, and then we're just one other quick follow-up. Uh, as noted, uh, the PBM bill and the formulary bill were vetoed. Um, any specific ways that these could be adapted? Are there discussions with the governor 
uh, to change those to make them uh, more likely to get signed? Yeah, actually, the PBM bill is being held up because there's a U.S. Supreme Court case that was supposed to be held in April. It's going to be held in, I think, August. So that'll be decided in October. Uh, I know Senator Breslin and I have talked about this um, at great length, and we're hoping to address this before the end of the year. Um, the uh, formulary bill, um, I think a little minor adaptation where we put it on the insurance companies to send notice to patients 90 days before any change is done. It gives an opportunity for the doctor, prescriber to review with the patient whether they need to change the medication or get the approval. And that way it cuts out the shock value that they see at the counter. Mm -hmm. And that uh, Biagi bill, I'm sorry, someone if you weighed in on that. Uh, I have not weighed in on that. I'm not intimately familiar with that bill, therefore hesitant to comment. Sure, okay. Then we'll go uh, through the rest of the assembly members uh, hitting on how they would advance or support uh, legislation to address high cost of prescription drugs. We'll go in alphabetical order. Assembly member Ashby, over to you. Hey, thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, I missed the last part of what you were saying because I was looking for those bill numbers. <laughs> oh, just broadly, uh, what sort of action do you support in the state legislature to address the high cost of prescription drugs? We've you know, heard about three bills. Any others? Any opinions on these legislative uh, proposals that have been mentioned? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely uh, proud to be a uh, co-sponsor and support, uh, supportive of the legislation that uh, my colleague, Assemblymember John McDonald, spoke of. Uh, the PBM bill is A9902, and the formulary bill, uh, A02969. I'm on, both of, uh, I'm on both of those bills, and I think it's imperative. And I think uh, John had another uh, good bill that would have managed the, uh, that manages the cost of insulin. And I know that we've seen parity in that at the federal level as well, but it was great to see New York State kind of stepping up early in that area, and I credit John with that. I mean, certainly he's he's the expert in this, and you know, from my standpoint, and in, uh, in both the aging committee and the health committee, you know, he does an incredible job of kind of uh, giving a, a, a nonpartisan approach to this and uh, being, being a good guide through that process. So I'm proud. To, I'm proud to be part of all of those things. Other areas that I think that kind of indirectly related to the cost as well is that there's another bill out there, it's an Abenanti bill that would create an aging in place commission. And I think that's related because I think the more people are, uh, more active we are, right? The, the examination of lifestyle that goes into uh, uh, in place, you know, as, as you age, and there, is, there is a corollary there in terms of medication and the, the need uh, the frequency and how we take care of ourselves. So I think it's important to kind of look at uh, direct corollaries and indirect corollaries as managing this problem. I'm, I'm on that bill as well. I'll, I'm going to be brief because I know that there's a lot of people out here and I know that there's a lot of questions. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Assemblymember Ashby. Over to Assemblymember Tag. Wait, going from A to T, huh? <laughs> uh, Usually it's good to be uh, low in the uh, alphabetical order because you don't have to say much because everybody else has answered your questions. You're putting me on the spot, John. Anyways, um, I'm a proud sponsor of A7196A, which is a Michael Dendecker bill. Uh, you know, I think, you know, we need to do everything we can to facilitate uh, development and distribution of low cost generic drugs whenever it's possible. Um, I myself support uh, removing as many roadblocks as possible. Um, someone that uses prescription drugs, I'm a diabetic uh, myself, so um, I also had a valve, uh, heart valve replacement uh, back two years ago. Um, and it was frustrating during this pandemic um, to, to be able to get the prescriptions that were needed. You know, so, Again, I'm, I've been supportive of all the bills that Jake uh, has mentioned. And, and of course, um, as far as I'm concerned, John McDonald is a professional when it comes to this, uh, this discussion. And uh, many times when he brings legislation to the floor, I, I would also be uh, a co-sponsor or someone that supports that legislation because this is a guy that that's his business. This is what he does. These are the people that he works with every day. So. Again, I, I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, we have to facilitate and develop 
uh, and distribution uh, a low cost, especially to our seniors. Right, thank you, Assembly Member. Uh, over to Assemblywoman Walsh. Yeah, thank you. I really, I just want to say thank you for for hosting this too. This is this is a great conversation. Um, I think, as Kat said at the beginning, you know, for the show of hands about who's taking prescription drugs, you know, what, like, where do we come from? How do, how is our legislative work informed by what happens in our lives? Um, my 94-year-old mom, who's legally blind, has macular degeneration and um, glaucoma, and those little tiny little vials of eye drops are the most expensive thing that she has to pay for every month. And so prescription, controlling prescription drug costs as much as we can is something that is that hits home for me. And um, so just very quickly, because I think some of this has been mentioned, but um, in the state ops bill this year, I supported the, um, the uh, EPIC uh, program to reimburse participating pharmacies. I, uh, I'm interested in the bill that I know AARP strongly supports that um, is the Godfrey Bill uh, A7588 that would establish a program to import um, certain FDA-approved drugs from Canada as a way to control costs. That that was um, never considered by the Higher Ed Committee. I, I think it might have been on a kill calendar this year. Oh, in, in 2019, it was, um, it was uh, not considered. So I don't know that it's been acted on this year. There's, um, there's that People Stokes bill, uh, A2969A, to prohibit a health care plan from making prescription drug formulary changes during the contract year. I think that's really important. I was a, I was a proud yes on that one. And then uh, following up on what um, John McDonald said about the, the particular impact that COVID is having on our seniors and costs, um, I supported uh, Neely Rozick's bill this year, the um, A10270, that really tried to get at price gouging and that whole problem that I think is particularly, you know, unfortunately, uh, something that could could crop up during a pandemic like we like we're facing right now. And just quickly, last, I'm I'm a proud co-sponsor of a bill A4571, which would require, along with Assemblymember Smullen, to require prescription drug packages to inc include the brand name prescribed, not merely the generic type of medication. Because although generics work great, a lot of the time um, I do think that sometimes doctors prefer. To, um, to at least try a patient out first on the brand name, or maybe there's been a, an adverse reaction to the generic. And I think in those instances, that's one of those surprise costs that can really hit the consumer if they need to take a, uh, uh, of an on-label um, prescription med. So um, I, I don't, it's being held, that bill right now is being held in Consumer Affairs and Protection, but I, I hope something like that could, uh, could go through, so. Thanks. Last but not least, uh, Assemblywoman Warner, over to you. And Chris, I, I have to tell you, I am almost always last in the alphabetic order. So <laughs> I am. I, I concur with your observation that that by the time they get to me, it's almost always the things have been said. Um, so, like my colleagues uh, before me, uh, I I too ha have had my own experiences caring for my mother about how expensive drugs can be and, and really how much of a percentage of their monthly income goes to the, uh, the purchase of, of prescription medications. Uh, I learned early on how important the EPIC program is and, and like Assemblywoman Walsh um, was very supportive and pushed to have that program extended once again in our budget this year. I think the, the, the points that have been raised about uh, the, regulating the PBMs, about uh, uh, improving the formularies, right. importing drugs from Canada, if that's what we need to do to get lower cost drugs, are all critical things. I would broaden the conversation briefly just to suggest that one of the challenges we have in rural communities upstate is that there are uh, few, uh, pharmacies are few and far between. And the role of the pharmacist as a healthcare provider, as, an, as a consultant and an advisor um, on a lot of dimensions when a, when a patient comes to pick up their prescription is really critical. And in our rural communities, sadly, that resource is no longer available to, uh, to the residents of those communities. And, and, and the access to adequate healthcare in rural communities is something that 
um, I, is a real focus of mine. And as we go forward, um, I'm going to continue to focus on the unique challenges that uh, rural residents face with respect to uh, uh, adequate advice and counsel um, from their pharmacists, as well as uh, access to basic primary care in the rural communities. Thank you, Selena Woman. And uh, we'll let you go first on the next question. We'll go in reverse <laughs> order, um, just to be fair to everyone. Um, uh, arguably an even bigger uh, story in the news lately, nursing homes. Um, over 6,300 New Yorkers have died in nursing homes from COVID-19. Legislature, as you know, recently passed a bill to repeal the legal immunity that is granted to nursing homes for non-COVID related issues and only going forward, not retroactively for COVID and non-COVID related issues. Did this legislation go far enough? Do you support a retroactive approach? Uh, what other proposals and, or initiatives do you see going forward to address disparities related to receiving long-term care, whether in facilities or at home from paid caregivers? or unpaid family caregivers. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there, a, a very hot topic now. Uh, Assemblywoman Warner, back to you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, John, I'll be, I'll be really frank. I actually didn't support the, uh, the repeal of the immunity for nursing homes, and I'll tell you why. You know, the nursing homes are, uh, frankly, understaffed to begin with and underpaid um, which is leading to the understaffing. So we have, we have cut the funding to the reimbursements to nursing homes dramatically over the years, which has put them in a significant financial, um, financially stressed position. Um, and that gets manifested in their staffing decisions. And, and under normal circumstances, they limp along and they do okay. And for the most part, um, they are safe and effective places to recover from a medical procedure or to age. Um, but in the face of a pandemic where uh, if the disease got inside the nursing home, um, the, the, the cracks in that system became fissures. And I think, at least in the experience I have working with the nursing homes in the 113th Assembly District, they did a remarkable job of making, of making people safe, of uh, trying to react and respond to the, the series of regulations and regulatory changes that came at them. Um, and they did the very best they could. And I am, you know, I, I don't want to punish the administrators in the nursing homes or the caregivers that work in the nursing homes um, for a system that frankly has, uh, has ignored the needs of nursing homes for too very long. And if we truly care for the least among us, then frankly, we need to do a much better job of making sure that nursing homes have the resources that they need to effectively deliver the care. And then secondly, we need to really be focused on how do we keep more people aging at home? You know, home-based care is really critical. And we're, again, underfunding those resources. And particularly in, in rural communities where, where it's spread out, getting a home-based nurse to visit a, an aging patient is, you know, they get there maybe once every couple of weeks for a very short period of time. They're not reimbursed for the travel time. So you find that you can't get people to, to work those jobs. Um, it's a critical problem, and it's not going to be made better by by changing in this in this um, in this time period the liability standards. Um, we need to protect residents. There's no question, um, but I'm not going to punish a a set of institutions that are doing the best they can um, under horrible circumstances that are largely of the government's making. Yep. A quick follow-up for you then, uh, anything the state legislature can or should do to support nursing homes to address this issue and or anything that can be done specifically uh, to promote home-based care? Well, I think the most important thing we can do is increase the reimbursement rates, recognize that a, um, a case mix that includes people with um, Alzheimer's and cognitive uh, issues they have just as much uh, need for care, even more need for care than a medically um, than a medical patient does, and so the case mix has to 
the, the reimbursement rate driven by the case mix has to reflect the true cost of care, both, both sort of uh, uh, physical care as, as well as medical care. And, um, and right now it doesn't. So I think that's, you know, it always comes down to money. Um, but that's really the big issue. And likewise, um, the home-based care, it all comes down to money. And, and we, need to put, we need to put resources where they're most needed. And I would, I would um, suggest to you that, that they're needed in our nursing facilities. Great. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, Assemblywoman Walsh, over to you. So I appreciate my colleagues' thoughtful comments, you know, as always. And I think that just as this panel is you know, a bipartisan panel, we are, we're also coming from um, different positions as far as what, are, you know, what is the makeup of our district and what we feel is the vote that, you know, re reflects um, what our district would want us to do. I, I did support the um, assembly bill that Mr. Uh, Kim carried uh, because I felt that at least a partial rollback of um, liability was appropriate under the circumstances. Um, I, from what I understand, there were several pieces of kind of competing legislation um, to address this issue, but it was Mr. Kim's bill that got to the mm -hmm. floor. And um, so it, just like anything, it, it did, I know it did not go as far as AERP wished it to go. Um, <laughs> they would, would, would want to see it um, be retroactive, not just prospective. I get that. But as is the case with so many pieces of legislation that we look at, um, there's, there are compromises that are made to get that bill um, to have a, a core a yes vote that's going to be able to get it to the floor and get it through. So I did support it. Um, but I also, um, I also want to talk about some other, I think, legislation on this issue that I think is really critical. Um, one of the things that I did support that I think is really important is uh, a bill that uh, would require every nursing home in the state to develop a pandemic emergency plan. I think, you know, here we are, and I have the greatest sympathy for nursing homes and assisted living. And my mom was at a, um, at a senior apartment um, which there was always a question from the beginning about as these executive orders kind of came rolling out from the governor's office, the, oh, the questions was, were always, you know, well, does that apply to assisted living? Does that apply to, you know, uh, senior apartments? And it, it, it's just been very difficult, very, um, very fluid, a lot of decision making by executive order, and that's been very tough. But I do think that looking forward, I think that develop, the development of a pandemic emergency plan is very important. And I also think it's important now, and I do support um, Senator Tedisco's push. I have the Senate number uh, 8756 to have an independent bipartisan commission really look at what happened and why those 6,300 lives were lost in nursing homes and what lessons can be learned. If there is a second wave of COVID or for just going forward, I think we need to do the hard work of unpacking what happened, to what extent did the Department of Health memo um, requiring the nursing homes to make decisions about accepting COVID patients, you know, to what extent did that play a role? And, you know, I, I, I support that. I don't know uh, where that is as far as the assembly side of things. I should, but I don't. Um, and I do think that um, there are a couple other bills, but I don't want to monopolize the time. So I'll, I'll let it go there. But um, very difficult issue and one that, you know, I think that we probably all have something to say about. So I'll let somebody else talk. Yeah, thank you, Assemblywoman. Assemblyman Tag, over to you. Yeah, uh, first of all, I don't think it could be said any better than what Assemblywoman Warner said. I think she hit most of the topics right head on as did Assemblywoman Walsh. Um, my wife is actually a home care provider and also works in a, works in a nursing home, as does my daughter. So the issue with the short staffing, I, I can tell firsthand because I hear the stories um, when <clears throat> both my family members come home. Um, as far as retroactive uh, in the bill, I don't agree with that uh, as well as Assemblywoman Warner. Um, I think the nursing homes and, and a lot of our people, our first responders and others, uh, when this pandemic first started, um, 
you know, they were just told what they had to do. Um, you know, and I think they did the best job they possibly could. Um, moving forward, I did support um, the legislation moving forward that would hold them responsible. And, and the reason why I did is I figured that now they know where we are. Now they know what has happened. Now it's their responsibility to fix those problems. But before that, I, I just don't feel that, that we can hold them responsible uh, retroactively. Um, you know, I think some of the problem with the shortages in our nursing homes are the fact that we don't pay the employees of those nursing home, homes enough. I mean, let's, let's just put it out on the table. These are people that take care of our loved ones, our most vulnerable, and in most cases, they make between 11 and $12 an hour. And, uh, you know, we, that's something that we need to fix uh, moving forward. And on the issue of the deaths, I, too, support uh, Senator Tedisco and uh, some of my colleagues in the Assembly. I think we need uh, an independent investigation, uh, not from political partisans, but from professionals in the healthcare field. And we need to figure out what happened, why it happened. And, and it's not about politics. It's about making sure that this never, ever happens again. As you mentioned, John, mm -hmm. earlier, when we first started this uh, broadcast, everyone on this uh, Zoom call has somebody or has been affected by somebody that is in a nursing home or a care facility. Um, so I think this is personal to all of us. And I think it's our responsibility uh, to come up uh, with ideas and solutions to make sure something like this never happens again. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman. Uh, Assemblyman McDonald, over to you. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Um, to be clear up front, um, I did not support the bill. I wanted to support the bill. I understand the merit of the bill. But as one who still works in healthcare on a daily basis, who works with a lot of the home care providers, who works with nursing homes. I don't have contracts with them, but I, I work with them in, in different aspects. Um, COVID-19 has exposed many weaknesses in our healthcare system and our long-term care system continues to struggle. Uh, you know, there's been very good mentions by my colleagues about the low reimbursement, whether it's to the facilities or not. And to be clear, most of my facilities in the capital region are not-for-profit or county-run. Um, they're not for-profit entities. Um, so I, I know the struggles that they have. Um, we know that the age of their facilities is getting older, not younger. We know that um, this virus particularly is sensitive to relative humidity and that basically in very dry climates or very humid climates, the, the virus thrives and that's, nursing home is a very dry environment. If it's not properly ventilated, um, it's going to be a problem. Plus a lot of these systems have antiquated HVAC systems. We really need to look at if we want nursing homes to be part of our healthcare system, uh, a capital infrastructure program, of some sort targeted towards making sure we have a proper environment, whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's just the flu, because you know we do see many deaths on an annual basis because of the flu. Um, the other thing though, and what really pressed me on this and made me vote no on the bill is this wasn't lost to me as a provider how the governor uh, rightly was begging, begging providers to come out of retirement. Nurses, doctors, we were taking medical school graduates and skipping the board licensing exam and asking them to practice. We had a dearth of shortages. We had a lot of people who had to brush, off their, brush up their skills and get back in the game, get on the field. Um, it very may, very may well happen again this fall. And quite honestly, if my mother or father is in a nursing home or in a hospital, I want a provider to show up and take care of them. And quite honestly, without that protection, I think a lot of people are gonna sit on the sidelines. And I think we need to be very mindful of this. And for those who say it couldn't happen, pull your relatives in Florida and Texas and ask them how things are going right now. And by the way, if anyone wants to know more about nursing homes, you've got two opportunities this coming Monday and next Monday to spend time with, at least on the assembly side, myself, Harry Bronson, and Dick Copri, as we will conduct um, 
hearings on uh, the nursing home and long, actually the whole um, residential response. So we encourage you to join us. Um, I'd pack a cooler and put another <laughs> chair, put a chair there because it's going to be a long one. Thank you, Selenman. Uh, Selenman Ashby, over to you. Are, are we are we skipping Senator Breslin? Oh, we'll go back. We'll go to him last. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I appreciate I appreciate that. Uh, I did uh, I did support the uh, the Ron Kim uh, bill. I I realize there are some uh, imperfections to it certainly, um, but I was I was supportive of it. And you know, as someone who worked has worked in many nursing homes uh, around around this area and in and in other states. You know, I agree wholeheartedly with some of the sentiments that have already been stated in terms of COVID-19 really uh, unveiling many, many of the weaknesses that we see in this industry and really showing just how vulnerable this population can be. And, you know, my, my mother was an LPN and started working at a local nursing home when she was 15 years old. And I remember going there with her as a young as a youngster and more or less just kind of hang, hanging out in the rec room and, and visiting and visiting with people there and it was an experience that you know certainly led me down the path of becoming an occupational therapist and and working <laughs> and one of the things that i remember um is that Staffing in those in in her facility in particular, and in other places that I've worked as well, you know, has really taken a, a critical hit. And I know that uh, Aileen Gunther's bill, the uh, staffing bill, would help remedy this. It certainly wouldn't fix it. Uh, and and I know that there's there's different uh, there's there's different opinions on it, but it, I think it's a step in the right direction. You know, I remember when my mother was working, you had four CNAs for 12, for 12 patients. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, they had the opportunity to really take care of people, to make sure that you know, they were set up properly, to make sure that they were getting to therapy, to make sure that they were able to connect with their loved ones. Now, I mean, we're, we're lucky sometimes if you, have, if you have two CNAs for close to 30 people, how is it possible that they're going to be able to take care of them? And then you know, in terms of what they make, it's one of the toughest jobs uh, out there. So I know that there are, uh, you know, there are a lot of imperfections uh, in, in this industry. And ironically, it's one of the most heavily regulated industries. I mean, just to be able to be a nursing home administrator, you have to be, you have to go through a licensing process, you have to take an exam, you have to go through that. That doesn't, I mean, that's, that's not equivalent in other areas of healthcare. You look at what it takes to even run a hospital. You don't have to go through that process. So I, I know that the government is already heavily involved, and it should be because their revenues all come from Medicare and Medicaid. So it's the sense that they would have to be knowledgeable in those areas. In those areas, but I think there are some really key issues that I think we're overlooking here, and staffing is one of them. And I and I'm hopeful that you know going up to uh, going through the next legislative session, we can address those. Great. Thank you, Assemblyman. And Senator, back to you. Thank you very much. Seems like an hour ago. And I think the question's been answered pretty, pretty uh, well by uh, all the rest of the participants. But in nursing homes, uh, you've got an additional number every year that are on Medicaid. And the number of paying customers at nursing homes dwindles every year. That's number one. Number two, we've never had good reimbursement rates anyway. Number three, the number of uh, people living longer, uh, they accumulate more disabilities, more difficult, more vulnerable, uh, yet no additional dollars. So uh, I agreed with the original legislation to protect, among others, nursing homes. I think the act went way too far and included non-COVID type cases. So I agree with the legislation uh, that was put forth. And I disagreed, uh, only because of, probably I'm a lawyer too, is any kind of retroactive look back. 
uh, you should be able to rely on statutes just the way you rely on, on contracts. So uh, to, to recap, we have to do much more to uh, raise, raise the staffing levels, raise the amount we pay them. When you get burned out in a nursing home and you look and you can bet and make more money flipping hamburgers at a fast food restaurant, it's time to worry about our older people and take care of them. And, and we're not doing that. So. Great. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'll ask one more question on the healthcare topic before we switch to uh, affordable housing, try to get at least a question about that before we run out of time. Um, but we do have an audience question from Elizabeth Benjamin. Uh, New York's nonprofit hospitals have sued over 40,000 New Yorkers over the past five years often charging 9% interest, which is a commercial rate of interest, while the US Treasury rate of interest has been at 1% or lower. Most of these cases are for bills that total 2,500 or less. These nonprofit hospitals receive billions of state budget funds, including over 1 billion a year to support their uncompensated care costs. What will you do to protect New Yorkers from aggressive medical collection actions, which continue unabated during this COVID pandemic and economic downturn, there are a lot of bills and sponsors, but no committee and floor action on the Patient Medicaid Debt Protection Act, that's S6757A8639, and a COVID-specific Medical Debt Protection Act, S8365AA10506. Why are they not moving forward? Uh, and Assemblywoman Walsh, I know you have to hop off in just a minute. Any thoughts on this, on aggressive medical collection, any legislative efforts to address that before you hop off uh yeah no i was actually just gonna hop off so okay. maybe somebody else could take that one sure. <laughs> thank you though that's right thanks right. for thank hosting so this again yep appreciate it bye everybody um, and maybe just uh one or two of you if you want to hop in on that issue before we move to the next topic i'll jump in real quick john mcdonald um actually i've been sponsoring legislation for at least five six years right now particularly geared on the 9%. And the 9%, it not only deals with hospitals and consumers, but it also, it also deals with your governments, who, by the way, are picking up the tab. Um, any of these judgments, we are, and, and you know, quite honestly, I've been told it's the, those lawyers that are involved in the case enjoy that high interest rate, because at some point, the longer it goes, the more it builds. So quite frankly, we need a little courage um, from both houses and the governor to take a hard look at this because at the end of the day what we're doing is intentionally inflating the cost that consumers are going to pick up that's the unfortunate part and i i totally agree with the question uh, that nine percent is crazy um you wouldn't go out and ask for a nine percent car loan in this day and age and you wouldn't ask for a nine percent mortgage loan why are we doing this to consumers why are we doing it to governments why are we doing it to health care providers one has to ask the question. I, I would add on to that, John. John, I couldn't agree with you more that 9% is ridiculous. And the fact that it prolongs, it prolongs lawsuits because you can wait and get, make more money when if yeah. you go to a bank, it's a 2 or 3%. So uh, we should change it. We haven't. Uh, and I would finally say that I'm not surprised that that, uh, that question came from somebody who knows more about healthcare than anyone I know, Liz Benjamin. Yeah. Okay. So moving forward, we have about uh, 10 minutes left of discussion, so let's try to keep the answers short. We want to hit on housing. There have been some efforts to help people afford their housing costs during this crisis, but some of these initiatives will expire. Will you advance or support new or additional proposals to further protect people from losing their homes or affording their rent? Uh, Assemblyman Ashby, let's start with you on that. Yeah, I certainly, I certainly would be interested in taking a look at those proposals. I know in one of the bills that I mentioned previously, uh, Abenanti bill, let me see if I can find a number for you real quick, uh, A03240, that's the Aging in Place Council bill. And in that council, they would be looking specifically, among other things, at, at housing and uh, ability to retain housing and make sure the housing that they're living in is conducive to that. And being an occupational therapist and having a practice that looks directly at that, uh, 
ability to function independently or as an independently as they can in their own home, I think is critical because I think the longer you can keep people in a familiar environment that they can function independently in, the better off they're gonna be. And making sure that they have the necessary support in order to do that, I think is critical. Great, thanks Assemblyman. Assemblyman Warner? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, this is really a, a critical area to focus on. And, and I tend to, to be very focused like a laser beam on issues related to rural communities. And in rural communities, the, um, uh, we lose, people lose their home more often to tax foreclosure than to mortgage foreclosure. And, and, and when you start to look into uh, the tax foreclosure uh, uh, rules and regulations, you can understand why because counties must charge a minimum of 12% per annum interest on late taxes. 12%, we just had a conversation about 9% uh, interest charged on medical bills, 12% minimum. And then on top of that, they must charge a 5% penalty per year. And if you get yourself in this hole, in order to get it out, you have to, if you have to be able to pay not just your current year's taxes, you have to pay the, uh, you have to pay the most recent bill. So it takes three years um, for you to, three years of tax liens for the, for the county to take your property. But if you, if you get to three years and you can raise one extra year to pay, of tax money to pay, you can't pay the oldest one, which is what gets you into the, the uh, sheriff coming to evict you. You have to pay the most recent one. So the reality is that once you get more than a year behind, you're never getting out. And we have to fix this. I've had a bill for a couple of years to try and address this, to lower the, to lower the annual interest rate, to change it up so that if you, can re if you can recover one additional year of taxes, you can pay the most recent one off so that you are, you know, yes, you're always gonna be two years behind, um, but it means you get to stay in your house. And I think that the greater public good is keeping people in their home. So um, I absolutely agree. We have to, we have to deal with this. Um, there's many aspects to it. The one that I'm really focused on is what, is, is what happens when, um, when uh, seniors lose their partner and, that, and thus half their social security income and they find themselves having to figure out how to make adjustments and tax, they get in arrears in, on their taxes. Um, and I don't want them to lose their home. We talked about how important aging in place is. Um, I think it's much better for us to uh, give them a little relief on the tax side, the property tax side, um, than to have them have to move into a nursing home um, where 100% of their uh, cost of, of care uh, becomes the responsibility of um, uh, Medicaid. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, Assemblyman Tag. And uh, you're on mute. <laughs> I concur with everything that Mrs. Warner just said. She she's always right on top of things. Um, you know, I think that it, you know that it is a very serious serious issue, even especially in rural upstate New York. Um, you know, and I, I totally agree with with what Carrie said um, about keeping people in their homes. Uh, you know, I think the quality of life, uh, especially at that age, if you're a senior that has lived in the same property. 40 or 50 years of your life, um, I think that it's just very important to keep you there, uh, you know, to the surroundings that you're used to. So, you know, I think this is something that we have to work on. Um, you know, I've always been a proponent of folks that are still paying mortgages to make sure that their taxes are escrowed uh, that way, that, that to make sure that they don't uh, go delinquent with their taxes. Now, of course, I understand the problem is mostly with people that have already paid off their mortgage and just over the years, the taxes have gotten higher. But um, I think that's one of the things that we can look at. Now, I am not familiar with Assemblywoman Warner's bill, but I will surely take a look at it and uh, uh, probably something that'll be of interest that I would support. Okay, thank you. Uh, Assemblyman McDonald. Oh. There's a couple different things. I think my colleagues have raised some very good issues, all that deserve merit. Um, you know, as a former mayor, I always try to look at what can be done at the local level too. Um, we need to uh, 
uh, encourage particular municipalities through their zoning to encourage um, in-law type um, dwellings. Um, many people want to live with a family. You know, you talk to the Department of Aging, anybody working in the aging community, our biggest asset in the state of New York is our caregivers, those volunteer caregivers. Um, we do, Chuck Levine has a bill that he's been pushing for years that actually uh, focuses on a caregiver tax credit, which is important because it really gives a little bit of support to families who are willing and able to take in their family members. But it, the other thing we need to do is to also make sure that we stay current with our senior citizen tax exemptions. You know, we look at, you know, it's funny, Carrie is always appropriate in talking about the rural areas. I'm focusing on the urban areas. I have five cities. And interestingly enough, we have the same issues, right? We have pharmacy deserts at times. We have access issues. We have provider issues. Um, we want to make sure that um, we can keep our seniors in our communities because they provide that necessary stability. Far too often, the seniors end up moving out the house is left behind and it's either bought up by some out of town absentee landlord who may care or may not care about the property and everything you know the spiral from there and it leads to blight and all those lower tax base type things so there's a lot of local initiatives that we can also include and at state level obviously a caregiver tax credit makes perfect sense thank you Sullivan. uh senator yeah i, I think each of the ones particularly carrie warner and, and john that uh, we have to do so much more uh, from a government point of view to bring these houses together. And hopefully maybe a, a result of the pandemic is that people aren't traveling. Maybe they'll learn to stay home and there'll be more generations living in the same house where you have a grandmother who might also be very good at, at, at daycare and, and uh, has children who are very good at making sure the grandmother takes her medicines. So. Uh, the twelve percent that you mentioned, uh, Assemblywoman Warner, is just outrageous, outrageous, and paying the uh, the the the, the, la the first the, la the first is outrageous as well. And I will do everything in my power, and we haven't talked about it, but in the Senate to make sure your bill becomes law. Thank you, Neil. Mm -hmm. And I'll take just uh, one more audience question. Maybe if one or two of you could touch on this before we run out of time. Um, uh, an audience member writes, in October, the governor's Medicaid redesign team's proposal of a 30-month look back for Medicaid applicants requiring home care will go into effect, making the application process considerably more onerous. This will inevitably deter applicants from applying since we all agree that aging at home is a gold standard for all of us and accessibility to home care is crucial. Is the legislature doing anything to stop this from being implemented? A um, little bit of an in the weeds issue that I'm not flipping speed on, but anyone uh, aware of that issue and have any reaction? We're all asleep at the wheel. <laughs> well, well we're, I, I think we're, we're aware of the issue. I mean, obviously there is a lot of discussion and debate during the budget about the Medicaid deficit itself at $6 million. Um, there are some community long-term care programs that have grown dramatically and of course I think they serve a purpose but at the same token when you have a, a very high exponential growth you also have a potential for some things happening that wasn't intended and I think when you look at the fact that <laughs> to go into a nursing home there's a five-year look back period but to be getting long-term care in the community and that same um, that same uh, benchmark wasn't being used, there was a feeling that we needed to move from what was pre-existing, which I think was six months, <coughs> to something a little bit longer. Um, there, we saw such a great growth in the program. The question is, I think, the state, not, not the participants, but the state just didn't manage the growth as much as we should have. So this is an attempt to do that. And yes, it will lead to, unfortunately, um, some people not qualifying um, as quickly as they had hoped to. You know, this I, is something I, that will be subject to review. Senator? I'll add on to John that uh, we're coming at a point in time when we're going to be very, very short of money. So when we're talking about staffing, we have to watch out that it's staffing at least remains at the same level. 
and in every other part of government uh, with school children uh, not being able to go to school with health care under attack, uh, we're going to see things get worse before they get better. And it's going to place a much greater uh, burden on all of us to make sure that at least stays where it is and hopefully improves. Great. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we're almost out of time, but a few final notes from me. On Thursday, August 6th at 10 a.m., we will host another virtual conference with AARP New York, the Buffalo Region Virtual State Legislative Forum, so tune in for that. Also on Tuesday, August 4th at 1 p.m., City and State will host its own Economic and Social Equity in New York virtual event. Check that out as well. Uh, now to wrap things up, I'll hand it back over to David McNally, Director of Government Affairs and Advocacy at AARP New York. David? Uh, thank you, John. And I wanna thank uh, you for moderating the city and state uh, capital region state legislative forum. I wanna thank all of our legislators for taking time out of their very busy schedules to do this. And I especially wanna thank all of our members in the capital region and our residents for joining us. I hope everyone found the conversation informative, if not frankly sober, I certainly did. Uh, I take great hope in the fact that we can have these substantive conversations with uh, leaders, local leaders from both political parties. I think in this hyper partisan environment, it gives me great hope to know we can actually have some substantive conversations on issues important to the 50 plus. So I thank all the legislators very, very much for their time and their conversation today. Uh, we are in uncharted waters. The decisions that our elected officials make and the policies they enact are sure to have far-reaching consequences for, for years to come. And so I think these conversations, particularly in light of the pandemic, are so much, uh, so important. And I hope everybody feels that they've learned more. Maybe they have more questions than they started with, which is actually a good thing. I want to encourage everyone to find ways to reach out to their elected officials, to make their voice heard, to be a part of making the change that he or she wants. It's so important, and particularly in these times we're living, it's tougher. How do you reach out and make your voice heard when offices are closed and there's no rallies and there's no meetings? Uh, this is one way, and again, we want to thank the legislators and our members and residents of the Capitol District for taking the time out to do it today, and I hope we can do it again. And with that, I uh, thank you. Thank you. That concludes our program. Thank you very much. Thank you.